Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the first installment of our homecoming lecture series. Uh, we are so excited to have all of you here with us today and joining us for a very different and a unique homecoming at home. Um, for this session, Living Through a Pandemic, Science in Real Time, we are of course joined by Professor Heidi Elmendorf. Uh, Professor Elmendorf has been at Georgetown since 1999 as a faculty member in the Department of Biology. Uh, she spent her research career in the field of global health, studying parasitic diseases that primarily affect the world's most underprivileged peoples. Uh, as an educator, she is deeply committed to issues of teaching, equitable education, and student success. Professor Elmendorf is well known both on campus and nationally as an educational innovator. She co-founded the Biology of Global Health major and has shepherded thousands of students into the study of science at Georgetown through her teaching and foundations in biology. Outside of the classroom, Professor Elmendorf is deeply committed to issues of educational equity. She founded and directs the Hub for Equity and Innovation in Higher Education at Georgetown, working with partners from across our campus, our city, and the country in both K through 12 and higher education. Um, we are thrilled to have Professor Elmendorf with us uh, this morning, and I will take it over to you. Amanda, thank you so much, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm struck looking out at the, the some faces, lots of names here. Um, I recognize names. I wondered who was going to show up for this talk. And I'm sure it's a big diversity of folks, but I also recognize some of my former students who are now alums. And so uh, this is just tremendously exciting for me to have this opportunity. Uh, if everything went well, folks can now see the screen that I'm sharing. I can see Lily Jones out there. Lily, you can see the screen I'm sharing? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, nothing like randomly calling on a former student. Um, okay, so folks, this is this is delightful. Um, and you've heard the title already from Amanda, and I'm assuming at least some of you read the course description before you signed up for the course. Not all Georgetown students do that, we know that, but possibly all of you read through it before you signed up. But I, what I wanted to talk about today um, is uh, when I'm not giving homecoming talks, what I'm really doing is I'm just teaching and I'm teaching Georgetown students. And I know that we certainly had a ton of questions entering into uh, this semester about what it was going to look like. Last spring when the pandemic hit, getting through the spring was triage, right? And everybody just kind of pitched in to do its own thing. But when we started Georgetown this fall, we started it as a virtual experience. And that's a different place for Georgetown to be, for Georgetown faculty and Georgetown students to be. Um, and so uh, I, I just wanted to start by acknowledging that we're in the midst of this crazy time. Um, it's actually important right now, and it's important for the talk uh, that we're talking that I am a biology uh, professor, because what we're living through right now is a pandemic. And so uh, what does it look like to teach in the middle of a pandemic? Well, it looks a heck of a lot like what we're experiencing right now. Um, I, I've flipped my classroom and I pre-record lectures Students show up uh, on the right there. That was actually just a screenshot from this morning's class. Um, it's going to be a big group, I believe, here, um, but I'm used to this. I teach 220 students in the morning uh, in Foundations and Biology 1. Uh, I'm not going to make you do what I make them do, uh, which has become super savvy with a lot of technology. Um, but we break out into breakout rooms all the time. And in those breakout rooms, students are actively engaging and using this really cool tool called Jamboard. And that's shown kind of in the bottom left there where I put prompts out and they can put responses and ask questions and I can answer back. Um, and so, uh, and sometimes I'm even in lab, um, that, that's me on the bottom right there. I've got permission to go into lab. You can't see much of me, kind of like an arm, um, doing some actual microbiology and doing some demos. Um, so we're engaged. Um, I, we just handed back the second exam in Foundations in Biology 1, and we're not making it easier for the students. We decided that we were going to say that there are standards to learning biology, and we, we want you to see if you can meet them. And then at the end of the semester, we're going to be super aware about what everyone's going through um, and, and be kind and gentle in our assessment of folks. But we want folks to really learn biology. One of the super striking things that's happened is I've never had a class do as well as my class is doing right now. 
Um, and they're not doing that, you know, because this pandemic isn't affecting them. They're kind of doing it because they're doubling down in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and so I miss students. I miss them dearly. Um, but I have to say, at some level, teaching this fall is one of the greatest privileges I've ever had at Georgetown to be able to be with my students this semester. Um, for today's uh, class, our little mini class, part of what I want to talk about is this idea about the importance of teaching biology in a pandemic. Because I think sometimes the idea is like, you know, everything's going to heck in a handbasket <laughs> around us. Like, why focus so intensely on this? Why focus so intensely on academics? And it's because we're teaching about biology and a pandemic is at least in part about biology. One of the things that makes it such a powerful experience to be teaching right now is because we're looking at science happening in real time. And so this is in theory, this is the course description that all of you read carefully before you signed up for today. But I just highlighted one sentence in it. Right? Science is always happening in real time. I should emphasize that. But it's usually levels removed. And all that the general public ends up with is a highly filtered, parsed, sanitized version of science. Um, and most people then in the public aren't privy to all of the incredibly slow, turbulent starts and restarts that are part of the scientific process. Seeing that play out in front of you in your morning news consumption has been a really dramatic change for lots of people. Um, and it's helped reveal aspects of science that have been hidden, but I think it's also complicated how people see science. Um, and so part of what I wanna do today is tell a little bit of the biology of the COVID-19 story and put that in the context of what it looks like to have the story change every time you turn around um, and how we teach that. So I should say, uh, because I do this all the time, I am now at the moment on a very small laptop screen, but I can see people's faces on one side and I can see the chat on the other, and I can see just enough of my slide in the background to know what it is that I'm looking at that you're looking at. So if folks want to drop questions into the chat or comments into the chat, please feel free to do that. We find that's incredibly important in class so that people can feel some sense of connectivity. Okay, so um, part of where I think we could start looking at COVID-19 and how it is that what scientists are doing and what's happening in terms of its perception in the world is by taking a look at earlier scientific controversies. And so if we think about other scientific controversies, all I've done is I've taken clips from uh, news sources over the last few years about how much confusion there is. Confusion about mammogram, confusion about whether, whether red wine is good for you, confusion about climate change and particularly anthropogenic sources of climate change, confusion about BPA and plastics, confusion about GMOs and food labels. And all of these titles, right, are all about confusion. Um, and what I wanna talk about is this idea that it's not that there's confusion, it's that the science is changing. And so part of what happens is that scientists make some piece of a discovery. That piece of a discovery gets captured, caught up by news sources and described and described as a discovery, as a certainty. Scientists are like behind the scenes going, what the heck, well, that wasn't a certainty thing. That was just our latest finding. And we know full well that there's a lot that we're going to need to do to better understand the story. Next layers of science, things change, and all of a sudden there's confusion that reigns out there. So all of these controversies have been controversies about the very thing that's also making COVID-19 and living through a pandemic particularly hard. It's this idea that science is emerging and therefore seemingly changing. So, um, you know, you can think about where all this came from and, and why is it that the general public grabs on to the work of scientists and sees it as providing answers. 
And I think part of it comes from how we teach about science in schools. So we talk about the scientific method. So this is like if you Google the scientific method, this is, I think, the fourth image on your Google screen. Um, and what it, it does a tremendous disservice. So it presents it as this very linear process. If you follow the arrows from the initial moment of observation, you can track your way through and there's a final terminal arrow that ends with the idea of a conclusion. As though science is linear, as though research gets you conclusions, and as though conclusions are the end of the story. This isn't true, and I'm sure most people on this Zoom class understand that. But we still often tell the story of scientific discoveries as though this is what's really happening. Instead, if you want a better version, it turns out to be really hard to find the better version on Zoom. But here's a slightly better method. So I, I, I like this particular diagram. It, it's a wheel. It doesn't have a start or a finish. <laughs> There's nothing on it that says comes to a conclusion. It's all about questions and information and hypotheses and data and analyzing it and sharing your findings. Published results is down here. But there's no conclusion. It just comes back to retesting and restarting up again. And this is what the process of science really looks like. Um, and you can kind of start at any point in the circle and jump into the middle and find yourself popping back out to the circle in all sorts of interesting ways. That lack of linearity is important. The absence of the word conclusion from this slide is equally important. And so on this next slide, I provide an excerpt of a reading that we give to all of our students in the first year bio course. Um, it's a reading from a book uh, that's shown over there on the left. So the cover of the book is there. It's Evolution versus Creationism, an introduction. And it's obviously about thinking about and teaching about evolution. Um, it's by Eugenie Scott. It's a phenomenal book. The very first chapter is what we assign students to read. Um, and the title of it says everything. It talks about science, truth without certainty. So there is a truth. There is a way that the world works. There's a way that chemicals interact, molecules interact, cells do things. Um, but the process of science, although we strive to get closer to truth, is always about proceeding forward with abundant uncertainty around us. That's what makes science science. That's the cool part of science where we're not certain. Um, that's the reason scientists are scientists um, because we don't know all the answers. But that's hard. And we can understand that from outside the field. Uh, my brother is an economist. I'm not an economist. I just want answers from him. I'm like, dude, what is up with the economy? Tell me about it. And he's just like, oh, it's complicated. And I'm like, oh, I have enough complications in my science life. I don't need you to be complicated in your economics life. Right, so outside of our disciplines, we seek certainty, we seek comfort. So I think part of what makes the COVID-19 pandemic such an astonishing glimpse into this conflict between the sought after certainty and answers and the uncertainty is of course that we're just living through it and the answers matter and they matter in real time to us which COVID test you should get. Does having COVID protect you against future infection? What about the possibility of a vaccine, right? Those, are, those aren't just esoteric science questions. Those are real questions that are driving how it is that we're thinking about our lives on a daily basis. There are questions that are driving issues about Georgetown and in the spring. And are we gonna to be together? Are we gonna be virtual? Who's gonna to be together? Who's not gonna to be together? I can even see Amanda here who's like hosting the session going, oh no, she went there in the spring, but I don't have any answers either. And we don't have answers because we're in the middle of a pandemic and we don't have conclusions. So the immediacy of it, the urgency in our lives, the fact that this pandemic has taken the lives of people who matter to us, right, that all makes it urgent and important. What also is astonishing to be living through in real time, though, is the pace of it. The pace of life this year has either seemed like it's interminable. Everyone remember the sourdough era, um, Tiger King, right? Like, remember those days? And all of a sudden, it feels like we're like 12 decades later, and it's just October, right? Those, that was just less than six months ago. 
science is trying to keep pace with that pace of life, the pace of urgency, the pace of desire for real outcomes. And so um, I, I went back in history a little bit. I went all the way back to January 6th of this year, January 6th, and buried deep in the pages of the New York Times was this honestly not terribly important looking article. It was only on December 31st of 2019 that uh, China and the WHO branch in China officially announced that there was a new virus and, uh, and it appeared to be like honestly, legitimately like a new virus that was causing significant illnesses. January 6th, New York Times publishes an article about it. Now, if you go to the New York Times website, you get something instead that looks like this. This is the COVID-19 live updates. You can click on this thing and it will, this is from this morning, but it's like updated every couple of minutes. And you can scroll down pages and you'll still be on the COVID-19 news from just the past couple of weeks. Right? So the pace at which the science is happening, the impact on life is happening is honestly, I think hard for people to be able to understand and embrace. Uh, we often say the scale of science is all wrong. Times are either really fast and we talk about nanoseconds or we talk about millennia and the time is too big, right? So this is one of those short time frames. We can take a look at a different sort of timeline. So this is a timeline from the World Health Organization and they have a COVID-19 timeline that gets updated uh, in this particular graph, that the top version, I'm going to show a close up in a second, but in this particular graph, that top line, if you're alarmed by the fact that there's these kind of bluish bars that just keep on rising all the way off to the right of the, of the graph, um, you should be. That's the daily count of COVID-19 cases around the world. So for people who wonder where we are in the pandemic, that's where we are in the pandemic. Um, the fact that these cases are not just kind of, you know, going through the roof, I guess that's a good thing, but we certainly don't see signs of them diminishing. But I want to talk about the pace here. And so if we think about the pace of this pandemic, all I did was I zoomed in on a little tiny window of time here. So I zoomed in on the June 16th to July 9th timeframe. And I amplified, I kind of buried in the background the bars. So those are the COVID cases. Um, and just in case you want to know the scale, um, the scale over there on the left of the top graph as well, um, it maxes out at the top there at 300,000 daily cases of COVID around the world. Um, so we're well over 250,000 daily cases of COVID in the world right now. But what I did was I pulled out, um, they have this coding system for all these little boxes and symbols underneath that top row. And what those are is they signify different things happening. Um, WHO providing information, uh, describing science discoveries, talking about leadership and providing advice. So all I did was I took this short little three week window and I highlighted the scientific discoveries, big scientific bits of information. And they range from everything from dexamethasone being tested and approved in clinical trials, trials on hydroxychloroquine. Um, they talk about uh, the, um, I'm trying to read my own slide here now, close up. Um, oh, that held the big summit to gather all the scientists together. More discussions, more publications, more research about hydroxychloroquine. Um, and it's another uh, tested anti uh, vaccine, or sorry, uh, antiviral drug. Um, and then finally over here, talking about transmission and the importance um, of masks and how airborne the transmission is. Okay. So uh, this is the sort of thing where in normal time in science, we'd be talking about one of these publications a year and we're talking about them following right on the heels of each other. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to shift gears for folks and not talk just in the abstract about the pandemic, but I want to hone in on two specific case studies. So I want to talk about testing for COVID-19 and the mixed advice about testing. There are multiple tests out there. Again, you can go to the New York Times, a lot of other sites, and they have like trackers, daily trackers about tests, which tests are being approved. 
what has the FDA green lighted them for, what's going on in the global scene through the World Health Organization. So I want to talk a little bit about tests and describe why there are different tests and what you gain or lose by thinking about the different tests. And then I also want to describe a particular antiviral called remdesivir, which has been in the news a lot lately. It's one of the drugs that was given to President Trump when he uh, tested COVID positive. Um, and it's a drug that there's a lot of controversy about. And literally, the story I'm going to tell you, I taught it to my class a week ago today. I taught it to my class last Thursday, woke up Friday morning to a news story that said that what I taught my class was no longer accurate. So I didn't apologize to my class. I was like, oh my gosh, it's great news, science, we changed the story, but they're used to that from me. So on the assumption that not everybody here is a virologist or even a biologist, let me tell you a really thin slice about viruses, enough to help us understand the different types of testing and the remdesivir story. Okay, so the virus itself that we're gonna be talking about is called SARS-CoV-2. We, and by we, I mean everybody like me too, we call it like COVID-19, but technically that's the name of the pandemic. And that's super confusing too, because it really feels like the pandemic is happening in 2020, not 2019, but pandemic for when it first emerged. Um, SARS-CoV-2 actually tells us a lot as a name. So it tells us that this is a virus that's associated with lung infections because it causes severe acute respiratory syndrome. That's the SARS part. The COVE part in the middle tells us that it's a particular type of virus called a coronavirus. And that's important because it's not unique. It's part of a big family of viruses. This is like you're claiming your uniqueness, which is of course true, and you're part of a much larger family. It's also the second SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so for folks who have enough of an adult memory, you might remember that in the very early part of this century, around 2003, there was a large SARS outbreak. Um, and there was a lot of discussion, a lot of concern for it. We were quarantining people, planes coming into our country. People were not allowed to disembark on the runway until people had been tested. That was SARS-CoV-1. We didn't give it the one because I think we'd been hoping it wouldn't come back. But we got a new variant here, SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so viruses in general. So um, I know faculty aren't supposed to like Wikipedia, but we all use Wikipedia. So um, viruses in general are these submicroscopic infectious agents. The thing that really distinguishes them from other sorts of things we talk about in biology is they're not themselves cells they need cells, they live inside of cells, um, and they have lots of cellular attributes. They're pretty close to being alive, but we generally stop before calling them alive because they need to be living inside of cells. Lots of different cells will do. Each virus is kind of fussy about its home, but collectively they live across a huge range of life. This might surprise you, but we often talk about viruses as though they're all bad. Um, and most viruses are good. So you right now in a healthy state um, have about a trillion viral particles, viruses living inside of your body. And not only are they living there and not causing you harm, but the majority are probably beneficial. Um, so there was a cool article in The Scientist a little while ago, that's kind of a nice, despite the off-putting title, it's pretty user-friendly as a source to learn about science. Um, and they were just taking a look at a ton of recent research about viruses and how common they were in us and how important they were. And so you can see on the right here in this kind of simple schematic, these are just all different types of viruses. Uh, coronaviruses aren't a normal part of our virome is the word for it, collection of viruses. Um, so it's not on here, but there's a lot of other versions. There's a lot of diversity in them, kind of a speedometer here showing us diversity. They're all over the place in our body. Um, and most of them, uh, they distinguish here between pathogenic, guys who are gonna cause disease in us, and commensal, ones who are just living in our body, not causing harm and again, possibly causing good. And you can see that the vast majority of these are just, regardless almost of who we look at in the family, are good guys for us. Okay, 
If you haven't looked recently at a virus, you definitely should. I know folks are gonna recognize our friend in the top left, because this is now like the picture of coronavirus that's everywhere. Coronaviruses get their name because this uh, surface of proteins, these red things on the surface, give it this halo effect or crown effect. And that's a coronavirus. Um, but these are all sorts of other viruses, and lots of these are going to sound familiar to people because we tend to study viruses that are pathogenic and cause disease. So we tend to know relatively little about the good guys, and we know a lot about the bad guys. So you can look through here and recognize all sorts of names of diseases that you would like to be able to avoid. It's also worth noting that viruses are small. So again, here's our little coronavirus off on the side. Um, to orient people to scale, this big behemoth over here on the right, this is a red blood cell. So this is kind of a quote unquote average size cell in your body. Um, there's a bacterium, which are itty bitty by most people's standards, and that's E. coli down here. But you can see still compared to viruses, it's really quite large. And so I said that viruses need to live within cells, and I'll show you a slide in a minute that will amplify this idea. But um, if one virus gets into a cell and it's successful in taking over that cell and its functionality and making more of itself, and that's why they get into cells, one cell can produce 10,000 to 50,000 new little baby viruses made out of that one infectious virus. And part of the key to that is viruses tend to be really small. Okay, coronavirus is, at least in artistic renderings, quite beautiful. So this is SARS-CoV-2. Um, it has some things that are quite unique to it, but the general structure I show here is really what viruses look like. So those pretty pictures from before didn't really tell you what was going on. And viruses are pretty simple. They have a genome. They carry their own information with them, and it's the information about how to make more viruses. Uh, unlike our cells, um, some viruses have genomes that are made of a molecule called RNA, and that actually allows for a faster rate of mutation and change in these viruses. The influenza virus is an example of an RNA virus, and we all know how quickly that changes. You need a new vaccine every year. Viruses then create a set of proteins whose job it is to protect that genome, right? Protect the information at all costs. Uh, the proteins that it makes are called nucleocapsid proteins. And in our diagram here, they're just kind of these blue guys in the middle. Not all viruses have envelopes around them. That's this pink layer. This is a lot like our cell membranes, but when they do, that actually is one of its Achilles heels. So it's there to protect it. But if anybody has spent the year singing happy birthday to themselves every time they wash their hands, the reason is that the soap, when you're washing your hands, actually attacks and destroys this membrane. Um, so it is effective against all viruses with envelopes like coronavirus. And then viruses have these proteins on the surface. And these guys are super important. And we're gonna talk about them in the coming couple of slides. Um, this one's on the surface here. These guys are called spike proteins. That's the official scientific term for them. They're called the spike proteins. And you can see, again, they kind of give the virus this crown or halo effect. These guys are important. They're real signatures for viruses. So the spike proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus are very distinct and unique to it. And they're very important. When that virus is going to get into our cells and infect us, it's this spike protein who's going to play the most impactful role in that. Okay, that was the basics of what we needed. Let's talk about a thin slice of the testing story, and then we'll do a thin slice of remdesivir. And you guys are way less chatty than my actual classes. If you were my students, I would like to start chewing people out for like not participating in the chat, but I'll just keep on trucking because I would feel guilty doing that for all of you. Okay, so if we're going to test for any infectious agent, there's two basic ways we think about testing. One is you can test for the pathogen. Ah, oh, Katie O'Brien asks a good question. Okay, Katie, hang on one second and we're going to get to this. Um, so you can test for the pathogen. 
we can test, so SARS is over here, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is over here, and there's two basic ways of testing. Look for evidence of the genome, like is the SARS-CoV-2 RNA in you, or look for evidence of the proteins, and in particular, that spike protein. If you can find evidence in somebody that either of those are present, then the odds are very high that that individual has been infected. You can also look for whether the evidence of infection from our defense systems perspective is in place. So is there an immune response? Are we making antibodies against it? If you wanna know the answer to the second part, you should come to class in December with me. We meet at 9 a.m. because we'll be talking about the immune response there. Right now, I wanna talk about this testing for the pathogen itself. Um, Oh, but let's see, people actually ask questions. This is great. Okay, so Kristen, I'm gonna answer your question first. Hand sanitizer does work as well. And it works as well because the alcohol in the hand sanitizer, again, has a disruptive effect on that envelope, on that membrane. So it's really this pink structure over here that's the most important. And um, both the hand sanitizer contents, basically the alcohol or just the soap, um, and the soap molecules in a like, you know, squirt of hand soap are gonna do basically the same job in ripping apart that membrane. And once you've ripped apart that membrane, that envelope, virus is no good. Oh, there's great questions. Okay, um, so let me actually, Patty, I'm gonna answer yours. I'm, I promise, Kate, I'm gonna get back to your question. Um, Patty, I'm going to answer yours. So one of the reasons that I'm not talking about the immune response now um, is mostly because of time, but I'm also not talking about it because the tests that we have for antibodies are actually pretty good tests for antibodies, but we simply don't understand what it means to have had SARS-CoV-2 infection and whether that protects you. So you can tell if you've had it, but the antibody tests are historical and they don't predict your future and your future encounters with SARS-CoV-2. Or maybe they do, but science doesn't know the answer to that yet. So it's not that these tests aren't um, good tests, but they don't tell you the information that we really need. If they could tell us that we were immune, that would be great, but they can't. And they don't tell you you're infected now, they tell you you were infected a while ago. That's less relevant too. What we want in our testing, if we can't learn about immunity, is at least the here and now of an infection. Um, yeah, so there's people who've been reinfected. Um, and Kate, I'm gonna get back to your good question also here. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is mutating. We know that. We are lucky for reasons that are just the dumb luck of evolution coronaviruses mutate much more slowly than things like influenza. So although there are some mutations, everything that we have, the drugs and their efficacy, the tests that we have, all still seem to be good for the variants of SARS-CoV-2 that are out there. If you're like, but yeah, but maybe a new mutation. Oh, I know, that keeps virologists up at night. Um, but at least for the time being, we, the, the mutations that have happened haven't derailed, uh, haven't derailed the process of what we're talking about here. It is unclear, however, if when you get antibodies and there's mutations, whether it's like getting last year's flu vaccine, how good will it be? So there's a lot of uncertainty about the latter point. Um, how do we know about various papers? Hang on for a second. We're going to talk about science papers coming up here in a couple of slides. So let me walk people through some of the basic science about the, about the testing here. So folks have probably had this already done. Um, you take a swab and you stick it like up into your brain, it feels like most of the time, and it gets sent out for testing. Two different things can happen. So either the test that you've had done, and this is the most common one by far, it's the one that we're doing at Georgetown right now on campus, is taking uh, that from that swab, 
We assume that there, if you're infected, there'll be viral particles. We isolate the RNA from those, that genome, and we make a lot of copies. Um, and we make a lot of copies through a process that is referred to as real-time polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR. And if that strikes you as like, well, that sounds fancy and sophisticated, it is. And that's one of the problems of this test. So I'll get back to that in a second. But one of the good things is that starting with one copy of the genome of coronavirus, this process of the polymerase chain reaction can make literally billions of copies out the far side. So it's very sensitive. It's tricky to do, but it's quite sensitive. The other alternative is something called the rapid antigen test. And here what we're looking for is the presence of proteins in this, the spike protein or sometimes this little blue capsid protein. These guys, as this one that I kind of, there's a couple of competing ones out there, so I'm not shilling for anybody here. I just grabbed the image of the Abbott test. Um, it happens in 15 minutes. And this one works a lot like you're used to thinking about things like pregnancy tests working. So we take a swab, stick that swab up your nose still, and then just put it right there. So like stick it into contact with that area. There's just paper underneath this plastic holder. And so by wicking action, right, like you put a paper towel in a little puddle and it like soaks it up, that liquid and the contents of that liquid are gonna spread. All of these tests have um, strips of antibodies laid into them. And there's always a control strip, meaning that uh, there's some antibodies there that basically if you've swabbed and gotten out not just virus, but some of your cells. And every time you swab, you swab some of your cells off, the test will show up positive. And that's just like, yeah, the test worked. But the question is about how many lines you always have on these tests. So the other line that would turn up is one that what scientists have done is laid down on that piece of the paper antibodies against one of the proteins of the virus. And if you have the virus and some of those proteins hit those antibodies, they're going to hang on tight to each other. And when they hang on tight to each other, we're going to get a color reaction. It'll turn color. So a positive test, antigen test, looks like that. This test literally takes as long as it takes for liquid to get wicked across the paper. So it's a 15-minute test. One of the challenges with either method of testing is to understand about the course of infection. So there's been a bunch of questions in the chat. You guys were so quiet and then I was like, chewed you out a little bit and now you're just like my class and there's like more questions than I can keep up with here. This is great. Um, so one of the questions here is about like variation in how sick people become. So if you have somebody, if you get exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that would happen here at time point zero. There's always in folks kind of a latency period, a period when the virus is in you and replicating, but there's no signs of it. And honestly, you don't have enough virus in you, odds are, to be able to spread it to other people. Then you start getting enough virus in you. And there's this period of communicability. During that period, at some point, you also will probably start showing symptoms of the virus infection. Sometimes those are really mild symptoms. Other times that disease gets out of control. So we kind of draw a size of like the hump for the disease here on our graph. But you can imagine for individuals who get very sick, the y-axis here is kind of how sick you are. So we would just draw like an enormous bump here in the middle of our graph. That infection and the, um, the extent of the infection and how sick people get seems to have a lot less to do with the virus and more to do with your body's response to the virus, particularly your immune system's response. Your immune system is your defender. It also, however, in attempting to defend you, often unleashes waves of ammunition and causes damage that's very disproportionate to the risk. 
So for people who get very sick, it's often part of their immune response. And that's why one of the drugs that's used is dexamethasone, a steroid, whose job it is to, uh, a, a, an inhibitor of steroids, whose job it is to suppress immune responses. Okay, the problem with this, so let me kind of march forward and talk a little bit about this. The problem with both sorts of tests, so there's questions here about like, why are these tests like, why, why one test, why not the other test, what's going on? All the tests that we talk about have uh, the potential to be accurate. And so on this particular graph, a true positive means it was accurate. You are infected and the test says you're infected, a true positive. You're not infected and the test says you're not infected, a true negative. But for all of these tests, we worry about false positives and false negatives. So on the graph I just showed, if you sample from somebody who's been exposed to the virus, but that virus hasn't replicated enough in them yet, we're not gonna end up with a positive test. It's just too early in the infection. And that would be a false negative. It would in, induce in somebody a sense of, well, I didn't actually get it. And they have it, they'll just need to be retested in a few days. We also worry about false positives, telling people that they're infected when they're not. The risk here is less other than inhibiting that individual's life and kind of their plans, but the risk from a public health perspective is less. We're always trying for tests that are very specific. So they're not gonna pick up other coronaviruses, for example, just SARS-CoV-2 and also really sensitive. The problem then with the antigen test, which otherwise is great because it's super fast, it's low technology, it's low expertise needed, like users can do this. This would be the home version of a test is that it's a lot less sensitive. It doesn't have that power of the RNA-based test to do that amplification to end up from one starting virus to a billion copies of the genome. Okay, taking a look at time, I'm taking a look at questions. Oh, a couple of people have said here, so let me see here. Um, blood types, Kate, more good questions from Kate. Yeah, Kate, it does seem that blood types play an important role in how sick people get. There are blood types that are more or less susceptible. Scientists are still sorting that out. Um, there's other factors that predispose you to a more significant infection. So if I was to go back to this slide and we talk about the height of this disease bump, um, some of that is your immune response. Some of that are other factors. We've heard, uh, you've probably heard in the news about obesity, um, other inflammatory diseases can predispose you. Um, all of those have in common that your immune system is predisposed to create inflammation. And when your immune system is predisposed to create inflammation, that's going to exacerbate infection with a bunch of things. Comorbidities are often comorbidities of many diseases, but it will do that for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Steroids just help reduce inflammation. So when you're taking a steroid like dexamethasone, that acts to reduce inflammation generically, not specific for SARS-CoV-2, but it does keep inflammation down and that can help some of your body's worst reactions. Okay, let me tell the very last one about remdesivir and I'm gonna make this super quick because I wanted to leave some, a few minutes at the end here. So I'm gonna make this the fastest telling of remdesivir ever. Um, this was, if you were in my bio class, we would go through this in great and gory detail. This slide is simply telling us that there are five steps for a virus infecting a cell. From one virus getting in, so this is SARS-CoV-2 getting into a cell, to that 10 to 50,000 viruses over here in step five leaving the cell. One of the critical steps for a virus like SARS-CoV-2, because it's made with an RNA genome, is step three down here. And step three is about going ahead and replicating and then using the information in the genome. 
And this probably means nothing to lots of people on the call, although my students knew all about it. It has a really weird enzyme called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This particular enzyme is rare and not used much in our bodies normally. This isn't a thing that our cells use and rely on. That means that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase makes a good drug target because you won't hurt our cell function, you would just hurt the virus. Uh, it's become a hot area of study, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So here's a publication from this year looking at the structure of it. But one thing that we've known, and we knew before this year, was that remdesivir is a molecule that's picked up very specifically by RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And that enzyme, as it's trying to build more RNA, more copies of the virus, accidentally includes this weird looking molecule in the RNA. It looks enough like building blocks of RNA to get used, but it's a terrible choice and it blocks the synthesis of the new viral particles. So remdesivir should work. And indeed, back in May, remdesivir did seem to work. Publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, highly respected. Somebody asked, how do we know about scientific publications? Part of it is the street cred of the journal that things are published in, said that remdesivir was superior to a placebo in shortening the time to recovery. That's what I told my students. And then on October 15th, the day I was teaching my students, a publication came out, published in kind of a weird, funky place um, called MedRx. And uh, this particular site is one that publishes things before it's all been carefully peer reviewed. But it's the publication of a massive World Health Organization study that said that remdesivir didn't work. So we end up then with where we are currently. Oops. So you can read New York Times articles about remdesivir failing. You can read articles in Barron's about the company that makes remdesivir standing up for itself. Um, I kept this to the end of the talk because I'd give a real answer to it, but I don't know what the answer is to remdesivir. Um, we have highly respected studies arguing both sides of the equation. So maybe it's about how they did the studies, how they reported their data, who was in the studies. There's a question in here, Amanda, about allergies. Um, people with inflammatory responses, that includes allergies, can be exacerbated. So who you do and do not include in studies, right? all of that turns out to be absolutely critical. So uh, there's no answer to this one, sorry. I should have like some beautiful clean ending to this talk, but I don't because this is where we are in the uncertainty around COVID-19. I wanna just close by thanking people for today and your attention and joining me to talk a little bit about this one. I'm going to stop screen sharing. I'm not gonna go away, but I'm gonna stop screen sharing so I can see more of you. And first, just thank you. And then also I'm gonna answer some more questions here. Um, Question. There was a general question here about, can we make testing more accurate and quicker? Erin, yeah, we can. People are working on it, which means that we're going to complicate the story again because we're going to have new and improved tests out there. Um, we're going to learn piecemeal about vaccine. Vaccines, new vaccine trials are launched almost every day. We also lose vaccines from trials almost every day because some of them are failing. Right? So it's a constant turnover and change in things. How close do I think the labs are? You mean to like really getting good answers and vaccines? I think we're gonna get a vaccine. And I think that's a very optimistic and important thing to say. Um, we don't have a vaccine that's ready and we're not going to in the very near future. I should also be abundantly clear about that. The distance between being pretty certain scientifically you've got something 
and delivering hundreds of millions of doses around in a country is not a short-term phenomenon. So there'll be a gap even between scientific semi-certainty and actually having vaccines out there. But I have great confidence that we'll have a good one. And that's very important. We don't have vaccines against many important diseases. We don't have a vaccine against HIV decades after working hard to get one. Um, we do have a good vaccine against influenza. Somebody asked this before. Everybody should definitively get their influenza vaccine. Please get your influenza vaccine. The last thing you need is two infections from, vir from bad viruses at the same point in time. Some in infected people are asymptomatic. They always are. Um, their bodies, for reasons that elude us, are doing a better job of controlling the infection. And if scientists better understood that, that is true for almost every infection out there. And we still struggle to understand some of the very basic issues about why individuals get overwhelmed. Some of that's your immune system. Some of that is your health overall. Sleep. I'll follow my own advice. Sleep. Uh, eat well. Like Things like that really matter. Um, uh, individuals die. Why is our vaccine still going on? Why are vaccines trials are still going on? Um, it, Vaccine trials are complicated. Big scale trials are hard. Uh, they'll involve, at the end stages, they'll often involve tens of thousands of people. Um, and people get sick and die from a lot of things that aren't about COVID-19. So sorting out outcomes in vaccine trials turns out to be very complicated to be able to act with any level, again, of semi-certainty. Um, oh, there's a couple of questions in here that are very sophisticated about cellular immunity against COVID. Um, if you're a scientist, this is for you. Uh, so cellular immunity uh, is lagging behind the antibodies in terms of our understanding of how it works and our understanding about how to rapidly detect it. Antibody tests are looking for antibodies is just much easier to actually do technically. Um, so, but if you're thinking cellular immunity, because it's a virus, props to you for knowing about how the immune system works and the two branches of the, your adaptive immune response. Um, okay, Amanda, I'm not going to go anywhere, but I'm seeing that it's 2.52 and I'm feeling like we should probably kind of call this to an end officially. And then I can stay after class with anybody who would like to stay after class. That is so wonderful. Thank you, um, Professor Amendorf. Um, we're, we're thrilled to have so many folks joining us today um, and, and for this fascinating class. I'm glad I was able to hop on. Um, if We hope you'll join us for other events over homecoming. The full schedule is at homecoming.georgetown.edu. Um, but of course, for those of you who have to leave us at the end of this class, um, please feel free. But thank you, Professor Almendorf, for being willing to stick around. Okay, folks, I'll unmute again. Yeah, people should come and take a biology class with me. You should definitely do that. We have a really good time together. <laughs> Thank you for coming, folks. It is just lovely. It's lovely to see so many people so interested. Oh my goodness, it is Lauren's mom. <laughs> Hello, Lauren's mom. <laughs> We're gonna have to keep that between us, I believe. <laughs> Hi, Kate, what's up? That was a, just a great discussion and I'm so happy to see so many people turned out and you did a great job. Thank you so much. My pleasure. You had great questions, Kate. <laughs> Folks who are staying behind here, man, I see some familiar faces. Hey, Alex. I feel perfectly good cold calling people in this setting when I never do in class. If, if folks are staying and want to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute. I mean, we can certainly do that. You can drop it in the chat. I don't know, I have a question. Oh, sorry, someone else talked. No, no, you, you, you've got the floor. What's up? Sure. Um, so I'm an alumnus. I did a master's at Georgetown. Um, 
So now I'm in an executive role at an AI company that's stratifying patients. And so I think better characterizing uh, COVID patients based on a number of different modalities is going to be really crucial in understanding how to differentially care for different types of patients. So I was wondering if you could speak to the heterogeneity of um, both the symptoms and also responses to treatment so far. Uh, uh, Trevor, that's a great, uh, uh, the million dollar question there, right? So, um, so every, you know, box there in a sense, if you will, on that WHO timeline I showed, like gets us closer to providing data that can be helpful to you. So, um, so the, the understanding about the role of blood types, for example, like we don't fully understand exactly why, but we, but that correlation between different blood types and different outcomes of an infection seems to be solid. So that gives us something. Um, understanding that the problem is not so much in the virus itself and the viral replication, but in the immune response to the viral replication turns out to be very profound. So one thing that folks point to is they'll say that, yes, yeah, sure, sure, the case number is still going up, but the mortality rate uh, is has gone down some. And it's not the virus is getting better. We're just smarter about understanding that far from trying to activate your immune system and get it to respond, the key is to get your immune system to put the brakes on a little bit. Um, so, uh, so, ster so the anti-inflammatory steroids, um, uh, recognizing comorbidities as people at risk from being, because they have these comorbidities, pre-existing inflammatory biases in their immune response. Um, all of that kind of can go into data to better parse things. Um, there's also some obvious correlates. Age doesn't help anybody. The older I get, the more that becomes apparent to me. But, um, but like other body parts, your immune system actually kind of wears out as you get older. It's less effective at protecting you. And so older people, that's always just a comorbidity for almost any disease. Um, that's about as good as it gets in terms of a kind of understanding kind of, you know, ahead of time. I think there's also now better understanding, Trevor, though, as well, about the course of infection. So I think we used to think, um, although I showed that one little bump in the like disease, what we actually see in a lot of people is an early bump, and then it looks like people are getting better, and then it comes back, and the worse, like the second, you know, a day or two later is much worse. Um, mostly, so, the first bump seems to be the virus, and the second one seems to be your immune response wreaking havoc on you. Uh, and so knowing that, right, again, gives us better predictive tools. Sorry. Oh, sure. That's very interesting. So that almost seems similar to the course of uh, HIV infection in that regard, the, the mm -hmm. double bump and also the spike proteins. So if, if you don't mind, I'd just like a couple of questions branching from that. Um, why is a combination antibody antigen test not being targeted as a standard of care? And also, um, can you speak as to the development of a prophylactic treatment that could potentially um, prevent infection in the first place in higher risk populations? Yeah, so I think, I mean, so your second question, Trevor, which I'll answer first, is really about the vaccine, right, and having a vaccine ready to roll out. And then it's questions about how we prioritize the delivery of that for a prophylactic. Um, and, uh, you know, with an ongoing pandemic, and clearly the availability of vaccine will be limited when we first start making it, because it's made in, you know, the equivalent of factories, and it just takes time to make it. Um, how we prioritize who gets it will be a scene, right? Um, there's, there's clear choices around first responders and medical care professionals. Um, but beyond that, I think it's gonna be an interesting question um, and will raise a lot of very important ethical dilemmas for us about kind of valuation of life and evaluation of risk. And I don't think we're fully there yet on the evaluation of risk factors, as you all know. Why we don't have a combination test. Um, I mean, so we do in certain settings. And I should say, just to be clear, the best test out there, the antigen test, the best version we have, was actually paid for and developed by the NBA, um, trying to like protect players in the bubble. So, you know, go NBA. Um, we don't have one yet because 
this is a heartbeat since scientists started working on it. I mean, what feels to us like an eternity. And I want to be clear, like my lab was shut down for four months because like most science labs in this country closed because of the pandemic. So we slowed the pace of science. COVID research, we tried to keep going, but just overall, like the pandemics wreaked havoc across the board in research worlds as well. Thank you so much. Welcome. Patty, you've got a hand up from Peru. Hi, Professor, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if there has been any research uh, on the scientific end, because I've been, I've been watching and reading about the virus and, and people who have, um, you know, contracted it and manifested, uh, you know, the symptoms in a way that was, that were not really respiratory. Mm -hmm. They were more like related to uh, blood clotting, cause, causing strokes. I know two people who have had that and they're, rel you know, they used to be between, you know, the ages of 20 and 40, 45, 46. And, um, and also after they have recovered from COVID, they are still having those episodes related to blood clotting and uh, having strokes and things after they have recovered from the respiratory and also some cognitive issues. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just concerned and, and I wonder if they're studying the virus in that sense because it doesn't seem to be just you know, a respiratory virus. Yeah. Am I wrong? No, you're right. So let, let me answer your question. And I saw a Candace had a question, just a quick one in the chat about the timeline for the vaccine. So we're gonna have an accelerated vaccine. Where's Candace? I saw her here. Is Candace still here? We're going to have an accelerated vaccine pace, I should say, not for weird political reasons, although we might also for that reason, but we're just going to have an accelerated one because we're desperate, right, for a vaccine. So we're going to speed some things up. Um, it'll be less than two years, but it'll probably be like a year and a half. Sorry, folks, about that one. Okay, uh, Patty, so the question, um, uh, so it turns out that the molecule on the surface of lung cells that the COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uses to get into your lung cells. So when I said it gets into cells, in that little diagram that I like went past quickly, there's a very specific protein on the surface of your lung cells, and it uses that protein. It's kind of like a you know card access system to a hotel room or something to get in. That protein um, is called acetylcholine esterase uh, two. It isn't just on lung cells. It's also on endothelial cells. And endothelial cells are the cells that line blood vessels. So the initial round of infection in people is always in the lungs. But if you end up, scientists believe, if you end up with sufficient lung damage, that virus will then just get loose in other parts of the body. Your lungs are lined with blood vessels and capillary beds. It doesn't take much to get into those blood vessels and get throughout the body. If you do that and your SARS-CoV-2, you're gonna be away from the lung. You can't get into those cells to infect them, but you can get into the blood vessel cells. And when you cause damage in blood vessels, you either end up with diseases or outcomes that are about kind of perforating those vessels or you end up with efforts from your body to heal the um, damage to the, those blood vessels. And in trying to heal the damage, they'll often create clots. So the sequelae that follow from infection that are about um, kind of circulatory system issues actually makes sense based on what we know about the virus. Again, why most people resolve it as a respiratory infection. And in some people, it becomes a completely fulminant infection in the circulatory system isn't known. The other point you asked though, Patty, about the longevity of the symptoms is weird and we don't get it. So there are lots of people who feel somewhat sick a really long time after they've recovered from kind of like a, you know, no longer at risk of dying from it. Um, and the, the length of those, the dur durability of those symptoms, um, scientists don't understand. And there's questions about whether it's just body damage. It's questions about whether there are still maybe some reservoirs 
of viral infection in people's bodies that are continuing to cause problems over time. I think that's actually one of the really big and important questions that we don't understand well enough yet. I mean, one of the hundred, but yeah. But that's really important. Thank you. Bruce, are you still on here? Oh, I can see Bruce. Bruce, you asked a yes, question in the chat. <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so SARS-CoV-2. So the good thing about SARS-CoV-2 is, so Spanish flu is influenza. And uh, when people are like, oh, it's just like the flu, just for the record, that should not be reassuring to any of us. <laughs> like the idea that that would be like, whoa, it's just like the flu. Like, hello, 1918, bad idea. The good news is that um, influenza virus changes all the time super dramatically. And the difference from year to year, we have two terms for it. We talk about something called antigenic drift versus shift. So antigen is like a protein name. And so the influenza virus can either change slowly, it can drift, or it can change dramatically and it can shift. The big dramatic changes are the ones that cause pandemics. Um, and influenza changes so dramatically that we're kind of always at risk for something dramatically new coming along. SARS-CoV-2 seems to be, for reasons that again are elusive, but we're grateful for, um, less prone to that sort of dramatic mutation and change. Um, so the second wave, which we were supposed to be in by now, but I'll say it's also very unclear to scientists if we ever emerge from the first wave, because the end of the first wave presumed that we could control this as well as they did back in 1918. And we would actually see a dramatic tail off. And we sort of did this summer, but really it just depends on where you were, right? And then the infection shifted around the country and the globe. Um, I think it's likely, don't put any money in Vegas on this one though, Bruce. I think it's likely that the second wave won't be worse from a mortality perspective, from a death perspective. And I think that's because we've just gotten smarter about where the real damage is coming from and what to look out for. So Patty, in response to your question early on, scientists, doctors were treating the like development of things like a stroke or something as like some weird other thing happening and weren't really connecting it directly to the virus itself. Right now that we know to do that, we're just smarter about it. So I think Bruce, unlike 1918, like medicine's a thing now. Like we're good at it in a way that we really weren't back in 1918. I think that's gonna save us in terms of mortality rates. Um, the virus, the mutations thus far haven't been dramatic in terms of changing how it lives as a virus, how dangerous it is, how transmissible it is. There are some subtle changes, but nothing that's kind of disrupting our plans scientifically, public health wise. Um, but I also don't think that it's going away in the short term. Um, there's nothing happening here in the US and in many other places in the world that give you a lot of confidence. There are some countries that seem to have things under control, but they are taking a dramatically different approach and they have been for months compared to countries like the US. I'll, I'll just have to say, we're just, this is, as somebody who's been in the field of global health my entire career, it is astonishing how many ways we found to screw this one up. It's just a travesty. Um, and, and that's not gonna change. We're kind of much too far into it. There's way too many people who are infected and there's way too many people who have behaviors that are now set in ways that are counter to controlling the virus. So, you know, eventually we'll get a vaccine and that'll help. But, uh, but we have a long ways to go before then. But I, I don't think we're gonna see a return to the terrible levels of mortality. That said, the US passed yesterday, day before, we once again passed the thousand deaths a day mark. Um, and so, yeah, so we're there. I feel like I should have picked a more cheerful topic for homecoming. <laughs> this is like, Welcome back to Georgetown, folks, where we talk about morbidity and mortality. I think we probably could not have had academic programming over homecoming without talking about this. So, um, yeah. <laughs> my, my public service here. Monty, how are you, dear? 
Good. It's good to hear from you, Professor Almunder. It's been, what, four or five years? I was going to say, it's been a while since I've had you raising your hand in my classroom. What's up? Right, right. So given that you have all these experience with um, global health issues, I was just thinking, how do you think that things are going to look like when the flu really starts to spike? I mean, we're already in flu season. How's that going to look um, for D.C. at least? Oh, yeah, well, hmm. Uh, get your everybody get your flu shot. Uh, I think it's just going to be bad. It it it's. I'm not clear on on whether it's going to be bad because we're going to see a lot of like significant comorbidity. Whether having the flu is like itself profoundly disruptive in terms of your the progression of your COVID infection. Although there certainly is the the possibility of that. I think what's more likely to happen is I think we're actually more likely to overwhelm the, pub, the healthcare system again. So one of the things we didn't talk about today is that the danger, and Bruce, this gets back to your question, the danger of having real spikes of levels of infection is that we overwhelm healthcare, right? And so the, the image is coming out of like New York City from March. Um, that's, that's the risk when we just overwhelm healthcare systems. And so we start triaging and we make decisions like we would on battlefields, right, about who we're going to save and who we're not going to save. Um, and that happened in New York in March and, um, and in New Orleans and like in a handful of other cities. That's um, Britain here as well, actually, where they're uh, uh, wanting to lock down some regions of the country to try to mitigate the risk of overwhelming certain parts of the NHS. Yes. Well, and it's, it's interesting. So in the U.S. now, the highest rates of COVID-19 cases are now off in less populated states. And there's kind of interesting things we've learned about the fact that you don't need a high population density like a city. You just need a high living population density, like how many people are in your home. Um, and people are like, oh, you know, it's still not that many cases. It's not a big deal. But if you're in North Dakota, there also aren't a lot of hospitals around, right? So it doesn't take many cases to overwhelm the system. So Monty, I, to me, I think the danger is that we're going to have, if we have a bad flu season, is that we always have in our country 30 something thousand deaths a year from influenza. And most of those cases make it to the hospital. So if we have that layered on top of this, uh, will swamp the healthcare system. And that will just lead to worse outcomes, even if the two viruses are doing nothing other than just doubling how many people are showing up in the hospital. Um, so yeah, I got my flu shot. <laughs> you guys should get your flu shots. <laughs> Patty, another question? Uh, yeah, well, following, following on what uh, Montserrat was saying and the flu season, um, do you know if there they are are uh, conducting studies of what's happening in other parts of the world? Like like where I live, we're coming out of flu season, and we were already you know in a a very bad state of of uh, infection levels of COVID. But looking at the numbers now, I don't see that there has been any kind of uh, you know spike in terms of hospital hospital hospitalization or uh i i don't see it maybe i'm not you know i'm not i'm not a scientist like you are but um but i i i i have seen a lot of you know news and and and, and articles uh, reading this space about you know fear of what's going to happen if this to converge in time and i wonder you know because i don't see that happening in peru and and, and at least from the data that I, that we have from the Ministry of Health. And um, so that's one thing I wanted to, because I think we have to see it globally also. And, um, and the second thing I, I, I asked before, and I don't know if, and I'm sorry to, it's just, I'm really curious about this, is um, I understand that President Trump received two therapeutics oh, yeah. together at Walter Reed that were not, uh, approved to be used together or, you know, I'm not criticizing, I'm just stating the facts as I've, you know, read and, and seen and, uh, and it seems to have turned, you know, worked well for him being someone who is, a, you know, at, at an age of high risk and also he has a, you know, he's clearly, you know, overweight. Um, so uh, to me, it's just fascinating how in three days 
he was, you know, in Walter Reed and he was out and he was like pumped up. And, uh, and I thought, okay, this is, these are steroids. Uh, but now I continue to see him like this and I'm, I'm glad that he's okay. I'm not a supporter, but I'm glad he's fine. But I just wonder if they're studying, if it's possible to use these therapeutics together to help, you know, the average people that don't have access to that at Walter Reed, you know, and not just in the United States, but like around the world, if that's maybe, you know, a possibility, I, it seems incredibly, uh, I'm, I'm not judging, but it's very surprising to me that they would give the president of the United States an experimental combination of drugs because it could have been very, you know, could have gone very badly, but I'm happy it didn't. So I'm wondering if that could help and if they're doing some studies because I haven't, I haven't been able to find anything reliable, you know, on the online to, uh, regarding that. Mm. Well, so let me see. So Patty, so your first comments about influenza, I think are really important. So um, if folks don't know, uh, the influenza that arrives in the US most years kind of gets to the US after having traveled its way kind of around other parts of the world, um, particularly parts of the world that encounter winter before us. And there's good reasons why influenza happens in everybody's winter season, if you will. Um, so yeah, so the news so far about influenza, I would say, is good news in that it doesn't seem like it's a terrible version of influenza this year. Um, there's also some scientists who are optimistic about it, saying, well, we're already distancing and wearing face masks, at least sometimes. There's less dense workplaces and things. Maybe that will all be helpful and keep influenza rates down. And that certainly would be true. Um, I think part of the problem is the US at the moment has opted out of participating in any World Health Organization sponsored work. So, um, so we're no longer sharing data and ideas and resources like we have since the dawn of time with the World Health Organization. Um, and so our distrust of kind of the worldwide epidemiology organization is I think gonna be problematic, Patty, for our ability to kind of like not, not, I mean, we, you can know what the information is. You can go to the World Health Organization website and read it. But how we're as a country going to make use of data from the outside, like tracking what's going on with influenza, is actually um, not as clear as it as it would be in any other year. If I were to like say, oh yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to know everything we need to know before it hits our shores, and that won't be the case. Uh, the, co <laughs> the combination therapies and the experimental nature of it. Well, so the therapies he's taken, uh, that he took, apparently, you know, first of all, it's unclear how much we actually know. I would just preface everything I'm about to say with that. Um, none of them are themselves experimental. It was apparently the combination that was experimental. So it wasn't quite like we were giving him stuff that like last we had tested in a lab rat and now it was in the president of the United States. Um, he was monitored by more doctors than most of us will see in a lifetime in like the span of a few days. Um, I think it's unclear because it's not a very well controlled experiment whether they were really super helpful or he was really just going to be one of those people who despite having a bunch of comorbidities was just not going to get as sick, right? I mean, all of that I think is very unknown. Um, there's a lot of discussion though about if this is so good, like then we should make more use of it. Um, and there certainly are many trials going on, Patty, and I don't know about the exact combination of drugs that he took, but there's many trials going on about combination therapies. Um, in particular, dexamethasone is the steroid that he was on. And so, um, so that is being tested with all sorts of other drugs. He received, rem he received remdesivir and he also received other treatments, right? So there's like a whole, this is a scientifically poorly controlled experiment, shall we say. Um, but yes, but it certainly seems that, um, and again, it's kind of my earlier response, like we're getting much smarter about treating it. I'll also say though, Patty, most people who end up seeking medical treatment don't seek medical treatment the day they're diagnosed, right? Lots of people don't get seen by somebody until they're actually symptomatic. And at that point, we know lots of damage has been done and the immune system and the inflammatory response has been activated. So I'm guessing that part of his good fortune in all of this was the rapidity with which he was able to receive astonishingly expensive treatment 
in like the zero minute delay. That would require us to have a socialized medicine system. And we don't. So Bruce is like going, NHS, yeah. Um, right, we don't. So, so it turns out that the cost of the medicines he received is out of reach for most people in our country. And there is an entire other homecoming lecture, I believe, <laughs> in that simple statement. Thank you. Thank you. might be a loaded question, Professor Elmendorf, but just thinking about the holidays, are you concerned about what will happen? Oh, heck yeah. Thanks yeah. for bringing it up, Amanda. Holidays. Yeah. Don't hang with that family. <laughs> Remain in your pods. <laughs> um, yeah. Holidays are problematic. I mean, it's the whole principle, for example, about why um, my stepson is at Haverford uh, this year, and they're actually there on campus, although not in class together. So he's living in a dorm room all semester. Anyway, whatever. Uh, I think there's pros and cons to that particular model. But like they're sending them home at Thanksgiving, Amanda, and they're not welcoming them back. Because <laughs> they're like, when you go home and you mix and match viruses with everybody back home, we do not want you back on our campus. Um, I think the holidays in general, so influenza, I should say, for people interested in influenza, always spikes right after the holidays. You can basically tell when the holidays are, if I, if I removed the labels of dates and we just tracked influenza spikes, you can track uh, winter vacation, so basically the Christmas holidays. Um, so, you know, will COVID-19 obey those rules? Of course it will. Um, and people tend to trust family for all sorts of the right reasons, but you don't know where your family's been. Um, uh, so my daughter is in California and she's coming home. She's um, stopping in Chicago to pick up her guy and they're spending two weeks there and then they're renting a car because she doesn't want to come home having just flown and exposed me as she keeps pointing out to be, you know, mom, you're in that age demographic. Thanks, honey. <laughs> that, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, but yeah, but she's concerned. So she knows that, you know, she'll go there and she'll do all her masking up when she flies to Chicago, but then she and her boyfriend are going to rent a car to get here yeah. so that they don't have to fly and then like land in, you know, my house. In airport and, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a problem and I think we're going to get together with elderly members of families and that will be a problem. It's a, it's a very long year of our lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you said Tiger King before I was like that was this year? <laughs> that happened in 2020? Yeah. It is astonishing what sorts of things are like wait that couldn't be this year and then you're like yeah. couple of, uh, of quick questions. Uh, first of all, excellent session, Professor, thank you very much. But um, I think you have um, uh, talked about an, an issue that it's important regardless of what the airlines say about. Uh, how is it that you can get COVID on, an, on, 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 a, on a plane? I mean, uh, I'm a survivor of the a, uh, a, a one n one in, in, the, in the pandemic of, of 2009. And according to my physician, I got the illness uh, on a plane. I mean, when I was uh, playing from Washington DC to I don't remember the where. Uh, uh, afterward, I started developing symptoms and the like, and, and I, I have gotten the, the AH1A1. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thanks God, the, the, um, uh, uh, the time there was the Tamiflu as the as a, mm -hmm. uh, medicine to, um, to fight the, the, the symptoms of, of, of AH1N1. But uh, how is this uh, uh, indeed the, the, the possibility of transmission on an, in, on an aircraft? Yeah, so the rates of transmission, Amanda, should be pretty low, right? Um, because if everybody's there masked up and things like that, the real problem with airplanes is that airplanes, and I know they're working to change airflow, but they recycle air. 
So people like often get sick on airplanes, right? If you've ever flown anywhere and then you like get off and you're like, well, thanks for sharing the infection with me. Um, so getting sick on airplanes is, especially from respiratory infections is pretty common. Um, the airlines were working for a while. There was good spacing of people and all of that. Um, but now people are packed in like sardines on airplanes again. And if you sit next to somebody, regardless of whether the, the masks that we all wear um, are not 100% barriers. They, they cut rates of transmission by things like 60% or 70%, which is great and not 100%. So if you're sitting next to somebody who's positive and they're like a foot and a half away from you, or if you just travel in steerage class like I do, like seven inches from your body, and they're breathing on you for three hours, the odds that some of those virus particles will get from them to you despite wearing masks is really high. Um, my daughter like triple masks when she flies, and then she like strips her clothing off, I'm assuming not in public, but as soon as she gets somewhere and like, you know, washes them and like steps into a boiling hot shower and like tries to clean up. And she, you know, she's flown now twice since the pandemic started and hasn't gotten it. But, um, but I think a lot of people are um, not that attentive. And I, I should also point out masks protect, when you wear a mask, you're protecting others. If you're sick, the mask is very effective at preventing you as an infected person from spreading it. It's not very effective at preventing you from getting it if the person next to you is infected. And so wearing an act is a very selfless thing to do. It is beyond my comprehension that it's become a politicized issue as opposed to what it means to be a good human being which is that with the risk that any of us might be sick, we want to do our best to protect people around us, including strangers, right? Not just, that's what it means to be a good human being. Uh, the idea that now somehow it's seen as a political statement for either side just baffles me. Uh, but yeah, but the mask you're wearing protects others from you. It doesn't do a very good job of protecting you from others. Okay. Um, that's why a lot of healthcare workers have gotten sick also. I think people are like, why do they get sick? Aren't they like all, you know, gowned up and things? And first of all, if you're ha handling uh, health, you know, people who are sick, like, and you're intubating them, there are virus particles everywhere. But you're the, last, the mask you're wearing is only doing a partial job of protecting you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Just a quick question. Can you hear me? I can. You can? Yes. Um, again, from London, just in light of everything you've said, especially about the holidays, um, the mask wearing, the travel, the, the, the somewhat kind of complacent um, attitude that has, you know, come as a result of people being tired, fed up, even in, with the increasing isolation uh, requirements in, in, in Europe, uh, that second spike is well underway. Um, mm -hmm. In the US, as you say, it's not going away anytime soon. So in light of all of that we, we know and without really um, the, the medical protocols in place that say we know, know how to treat this virus for sure, remdesivir was obviously the great white hope. Um, and now that seems to itself be under review. Um, notwithstanding Trump's treatment, which seems to have worked miracles. Um, two little questions. One, is the anti-inflammatory the most important thing that has come from all this various research? The fact that this, if you can have the correct anti-inflammatories, uh, is this the, the, the best hope? My husband's asthmatic. He's on a lot of um, uh, steroids all the time. We obviously worry about him a lot. Um, but I just wanted to know, I don't think that we're going anywhere soon with the drugs or with the spread of the virus. So campus is presumably not going to open again in, in January. Well, so the campus question, I can simply say we are all eagerly anticipating Georgetown's decision about the campus. Um, we're all in the like not knowing boat together on that one. 
Uh, but I do think that from a public health perspective, it certainly isn't better now than it was in August when we made the decision to go virtual. That doesn't mean that as you're saying, you know, we also haven't hit some point in which we actually accept certain risks that we weren't willing to accept in August to bring people back together again, right? To kind of figure out, are we really not ever being together until there's a good vaccine? Is I think something that Georgetown and every other family group and business is gonna grapple with. Um, well, <laughs> let's come out of this. Um, so the steroid use, I mean, the knowledge that led to the idea that using steroids is, re is really beneficial, that was critical. I do think we're better at diagnosing risk earlier. I think we know some things to look for, like indications of cardiovascular problems now move you right to the front of the line in a way that did, didn't happen before. Um, I think we've made actually tremendous progress on vaccines. Um, I should just say, I mean, somebody wrote before in the chat something like it's usually a two year thing. Like vaccines, we usually say like, oh, give us 10 years for vaccines, you know? So the idea that it's even being talked about is like, oh, it's usually a two year window. Is I'm like, Monty's been in classes with me. Like I've never taught it as a two year window. <laughs> We've like emphasized the importance of the decade window. Um, so I think we've made astonishingly rapid progress. Part of what's happened though, is in the efforts to make it go fast, and in the distrust of the federal public health system that we now have in our country. Uh, we've um, kind of balkanized, if you will, vaccine development, right? So it's all almost all industry driven, and it's which is not in itself a bad thing, but it's all scattered. Mm -hmm. And there's very little unifying the effort. And we're not part of the big studies like the solidarity study that's coming out of the World Health Organization. So we're really going it alone and we're doing it in a fragmented sense. So the sorts of things that we usually see in research through synergy between sharing of results and coordination and feeding in to systems that are built to handle large data and data at system wide scale, that's not part of how we currently run things. Uh, we have, uh, we, we, meaning our federal government, no longer trusts the Centers for Disease Control. They don't trust them to track data. They've actually taken over the tracking of data. Um, they continually have them uh, retract publications about public health advice and reissue them. Um, and so in every other instance, the CDC has been profoundly important in our ability to coordinate rapid responses. So I'm super, super optimistic. Sorry, that was like me on a tangent. I'm super optimistic actually about vaccines. Um, and I think that there's a tremendous amount that's come out of that. It's just not at any point that's like useful to us. Um, but I would call that very significant progress. It's just not progress that we can like leverage at this moment. Um, and it's gonna take us ironically longer than it should because of the approach we're using, because we're fragmenting the approach and we're fragmenting data. Um, we, are, we are living through a textbook version of how not to handle a pandemic. Um, and, and that's not just our country, right? There's, looking at my friends from the UK here, there's something, <laughs> we've had some challenges in other countries. Heck, Sweden decided that social distancing wasn't a thing they needed to do. It's like Sweden people. Really, <laughs> like, what are we thinking? Um, yeah, this is an important moment. This is one of those moments in history that gets written about in, in books. Okay. Um, so we get front row seats. Thank you very much for your time, by the way. <laughs> My pleasure. I feel like I should be letting people go back to your lives and other homecoming things. There's all sorts of other excitement. Homecoming at home. <laughs> How cool can it get? <laughs> I just have to say props, Amanda, because there's nothing like selling homecoming as homecoming at home. I think that's great. <laughs> but there were a bajillion people here today, too. I mean, I've given versions of not this talk, obviously, but like talking at homecoming a lot. And usually there's like 20 people in the room because yeah, there's relatively few people and they're all outside staring at buildings at Georgetown because they're like waxing nostalgic about their time and like blah, blah, blah. So you know, the good thing is lots of people came to the talk. There we go. I think one of the things we're most excited about, and hopefully for those of you who are still on the call, I think 
we were excited because homecoming could be accessible to far greater people than would have normally been able to travel back to, to Georgetown's campus. Um, and so I think that was sort of our hope that um, even if normally you wouldn't have made the trip back to campus, we can maybe bring a little bit of the Hilltop to you this weekend. So, so we'll see. But thank you so much for, for your time, Professor Elmendorf. Yeah. Been fantastic. This was my pleasure. It was delightful. I can see like some of my students. Alex, I know you're only here because YZ's is like not accessible. <laughs> but I see other people out there. I'm pretty sure Mariette is still there. And I know Sarah is there. I can see a few names on my screen still. So especially for my former students. Oh, look. Oh, there's Sarah. Sarah's probably treating people. She's one of those doctors we've been talking about. Oh. Okay, folks, take care. Stay healthy. And uh, enjoy the rest of homecoming. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.